Welcome back everybody. This is section 8 of PLC Programming from Scratch and we are going to be talking about alarms and notifications. And what are these? What's the difference between them? Well, actually there is a difference and these two go hand in hand. Alarms tell the system whenever something's wrong, whenever something's out of whack, whenever a process is out of control, whenever a piece of equipment isn't working correctly. Alarms interrupt processes, they bring things grinding to a halt, they protect people, they protect equipment, they protect product. Notifications are their close cousins. This is what we do to let somebody know that there was an alarm, to let them know something is getting a little bit out of whack, to let them know that the system needs their attention. And a common mistake that we see a lot of people doing is using alarms and no separate notifications or using notifications and no separate alarms. So what we're going to be looking at is the best practice for programming alarms and notifications and a very robust system of control to handle both in a way that one, takes better care of the equipment and two, maybe just as importantly, makes your customers very happy with you. So stick around. Some of the logic is going to be a little bit tricky. So dig in, pay attention, focus, get the most out of it, learn this system of alarms and notifications programming, and by the time you're done with this course, you'll not only be able to write a PLC program, but you'll be able to write logic for alarms and notifications better than most of the programs out there, so stick around. Well, before we get started programming alarms, we're going to talk about something that's even more important and more fundamental, and that is consideration. Before we start putting any logic into a program, the first thing we really need to do is stop and think and plan how to program alarms and notifications for each and every system. The reason is there are several factors that you want to consider and not all alarms and notifications are alike. The first consideration on a programmer's mind is always safety. What alarms do we absolutely have to have no matter what? What are the alarms that have to be in a program? And obviously, for anything critical, we want to notify an operator. But there are limits to all of these things. We don't need an alarm for every single thing that happens in a system. There are certain things that don't affect the process, that don't endanger anybody, that don't damage equipment, and even though you have an analog signal coming in, you might not need a high high and or a low low alarm condition just because you know how to program an LL and an HH doesn't mean you need to every single time. Also, you want to be particular about what notifications you provide your operators. If you give them an abundance of notifications for everything that happens every day in a system, they're probably going to stop looking at them after a few days, in which case anything important that you try to notify them of is going to be lost and they're not even going to know it happened. They're going to hit a reset button, hit a clear button, hit an acknowledge button, and make your important notifications disappear with all the garbage that you decided to put into the system just because you know how to do it. More is not always merrier you have to take consideration. What does the operator need to know? What does the operator want to know? What's beneficial? What is going to keep people safe? What's going to keep the system running the way that it's supposed to be running? Take into consideration how your alarms are actually going to function and how your notifications are actually going to function. For instance, if a problem occurs at 3 in the morning when nobody's monitoring a system, let's say a part of your system is going to shut down. Well, if that 
condition resolves itself automatically. Do you really want to leave the system shut down for six hours until somebody comes in to look at it? Or, if the problem goes away on its own and it's nothing too critical, would it be smarter to let the system go ahead and resume operation? Well, consider that system might be filtering drinking water for a small community. Do you really want them to wake up in the morning and not be able to take a shower because maybe at one point in the night your tank level got a little too low? That's going to seem really silly when the operator comes in in the morning and the tank's full and everybody's yelling at them because they don't have any water. Obviously, if the tank's running low, that's something the operator's going to want to know about. Maybe he's going to need a larger pump or a secondary pump for times of high demand. On the other hand, you don't want to leave the system shut down if it's not critical. On the contrary, if you have a boiler that's getting out of control and heats up to a high high set point, you probably do want to shut a system down and leave it down until an operator comes and physically interacts with that system. Otherwise, somebody could die. So while consistency is oftentimes desirable, especially when it comes to a learning curve for a new system, if you have 20 or 30 alarms, it's not necessarily reasonable that all 30 of those alarms are going to work exactly the same. Some of those conditions might be able to reset themselves. Others might require an operator to interact. Some of those notifications can probably be silenced so they're not perpetually annoying an operator. On the other hand, some of those notifications might be a little bit more persistent depending on the nature of the condition. So before we start programming, before we start dropping logic and XICs and TONs, let's take a minute, consider our process, consider our operator's needs, and really think hard about what alarms do we need? How are those alarms going to work? What notifications do we need? Who's going to see those notifications? And so on and so forth. Doing that in the beginning is not only going to save you a lot of rework down the road, it's also going to make you a much more popular programmer with your own company and with your customers as well. Welcome back. We are ready to move right along with alarms and notifications. In our last lecture, we discussed the considerations necessary before programming alarms and notifications, those being safety, operator necessity, so on and so forth. So now we've actually got our level control program from a previous section open and we are going to modify that and add some alarms and some notifications into it. So this logic is going to become a little bit tricky, but stick with me, study the logic until it makes sense to you, and afterwards you won't know that there's any other way to program an alarm. So starting here, we have our main ladder, and from this ladder we're calling our two other ladders, IO and controls. In our I.O. ladder, we have two outputs, a valve and a pump, and we have one input, and that is our level transmitter coming in on input 3, 0, and being scaled from 0 to 100 percent and stored in the integer in 7, 0. We also have our controls logic, and if you remember, this tank alternates between a fill mode and a drain mode. The fill mode involves the discharge valve being closed and the fill pump being energized. The drain mode is the exact opposite. The discharge valve is open, the fill pump is de-energized. And here's the control logic for that, which you may or may not remember clearly at this point, but that's okay. We will be getting back into it in this lecture. But for the time being, we're going to click on our program files and create a new ladder. Ladder 3 is going to be called Alarms. And of course, for the Alarms ladder to ever energize, we're going to have to call it. So we're going to go back into our main, and I'm just going to copy and paste a jump subroutine from rung 1 
and put a three on it. So now we have our three ladders, numbers three, four, and five being called sequentially from our main. And our alarms ladder, which is newly created, of course, has nothing inside. So let's get started programming these. The first thing we're looking for is going to be an alarm for a low, low level in our tank. And then we're also going to want to look at a high, high level in our tank. And the reason these matter, if our level is too low in our tank, we're going to run out of water. And if you know anything about how tanks, especially water tanks, work, when you get too low in a water tank, you start getting all the sediment and all the crud that settles to the bottom of that tank. And that's not something we want flowing through our discharge valve and getting into a water distribution system, particularly if somebody's going to be brushing their teeth with that water. And on the opposite end, if our tank gets too high, it's probably about to overflow. And we certainly don't want an overflown tank because that doesn't make us look like very good programmers and that certainly doesn't make the operator look like a very good operator either. So we want to prevent the tank from getting too low or from getting too high and those are going to be the two alarm conditions and the two notifications that we'll be programming into ladder three. So the first thing we want to look at is we're going to compare Let's go ahead and start with our low level. So we're going to use a less than block. I believe we stored our level at N70. And that's our level, sure enough. And we're going to compare that to a low, low level in the tank. Now the first thing we need to do is look back into our control logic and see what our low and high levels are. Right now, the way the program is written is we start off by comparing the level to 20%. And if the level is below 20% for 10 seconds, then we come down here and we go ahead and initialize the fill mode. So 20% is our low level and 80% is our high level. So obviously our low, low level is going to have to be lower than the low level and our high high level needs to be higher than our high level. Otherwise, if our low low alarm level is higher than our low level, then every time the tank is in drain mode and comes down towards its low set point, we're going to get an alarm. And the last thing we want is an alarm telling us that our tank is operating normally. So low low needs to be below the low and high high needs to be above the high. And that range right now is 20 to 80 percent. So we're going to come back into our alarms ladder and we're going to set a low, low level of 15 percent. And while we're thinking about it, let's go ahead and create a greater than block, which is going to initialize a high, high alarm. We're also looking at the level for the high, high. And this time we know we need a high, high level, which is above our high level. Our high level was 80, so we're going to go ahead and make our high, high 85. So now we are outside of the 20 to 80 range, and that's probably a pretty good place to put a low, low and a high, high. Now again, back to considerations in programming, we know that water in a tank, especially a larger tank, especially a larger tank being fed by a pump, has a tendency to slosh around a lot. It makes waves inside the tank. So our level sensor is going to be reading the level of one part of that water, and there's going to be some turbulence. There's going to be some up and down on that sensor. At any given time, while the water is flowing either in or out, the level is going to be oscillating up and down and back and forth a little bit. So what we don't want is for our alarm to be tripping five different times in a second. We don't want 16 different notifications for one event. So we're going to program these alarms the way that we would most alarms in the field. And that is with a time delay. There are certain things like a circuit breaker, 
or an emergency stop button that don't need any time delay. Once an emergency stop button is pushed, you want everything to grind to a halt immediately. No delays, no timers, nothing. Simple direct correlation. But when you have things like temperatures and analog signals and levels, you usually have a little bit of fluctuation and therefore you want a little bit of delay. You don't want a noise spike interfering with a voltage signal coming into your processor to create an alarm when in reality it was just a fluke because somebody started a motor next to your panel. You want to make sure you have a real and steady condition before you sound the alarm. So let's go ahead and put a timer on rung zero which is going to be setting up our low low alarm. We're going to address that to T42 which is our first available timer block and that's going to be our LL for low low level alarm delay timer. That's a big name but when we look at that T42 address anywhere in the program we don't want to have to try to scratch our heads and look at a procedure and figure out what that is. We want to know right then and there what we're looking at. And likewise we're going to put a similar timer on rung 1. That's going to be a high high level alarm delay timer. And right now we have two timers with no preset. So we're going to go ahead and set these up as five second timers. And remember from programming fundamentals that the time base determines whether this is a millisecond timer, a second timer, or a hundredths of a second timer. And for most applications, we're just going to use a one second timer. There's nothing that we're going to be doing in this course that's going to require timing down to the millisecond. So we have our two time delays at five seconds. And at the end of that time delay, we still haven't set an alarm. So we need a little bit more logic than this. We need something that's going to establish alarm. And then we're going to need something to maintain that alarm. So I'm going to go ahead and put two more rungs into this program. And we're going to look at this timer's timing down. And we know when one of these TON timers times down, the DN bit energizes. And if all of this sounds unfamiliar to you, this is the point where you take a break from this lesson, go back to programming fundamentals, look back in on timers, get a refresh on how these timers work, come back here, and that way you're going to be able to keep up, get the most out of the lesson. So don't rush through this thing. Let's make sure you understand timers before we keep going. We're going to use an XIC instruction here and we're going to address it to T42 slash DN which is the down bit for this timer right here. And when we time down we want to energize a bit and this bit is going to be our alarm bit. So we're going to go ahead and give it an address it's now going to be low low alarm and now we have to start deciding when this alarm times down and when we energize this bit do we want it to latch itself permanently do we want it to reset itself automatically well a low low alarm probably isn't anything that we want to kill ourselves over but we certainly want to give our tank the chance to recover from it so let's go ahead and create a bit of a hold in for this alarm we're going to use an XIC tied directly to the B300 alarm bit so it's now a self-sustaining condition but we have to figure out what we want to put to the right of this condition on this sub-branch to break this bit, to open this bit back up 
so that our alarm condition disappears because we're going to have this alarm condition tied to our process. So let's think, what are our options? One option we have is we can require an operator to come and push an alarm reset button. And if we have a system that's manned 24 hours a day, seven days a week, that might be prudent. However, if this system is going to a trailer park in Indiana and somebody comes and checks on the system two or three times a week, that's probably not going to work. So in this case, let's look at our tank level and let's establish some tank level to reset this alarm. Now we can look at the low level, we can use a new level altogether, or we could even look to the high level. But in this case, assuming we have an appropriately sized pump, I think we can probably go ahead and get away with using our low level. So we're going to use another compare block and we're going to look for our level to be less than 20 percent. So what this means is when our level is below 15 percent this timer is going to start timing and if it stays below 15 percent for five seconds then this down bit is going to energize and trigger this alarm. Once this alarm is triggered, it's going to hold itself in and it's going to continue to hold itself in as long as the level remains below 20%. So once this tank starts filling back up, the first thing that happens is the level is going to rise above the 15% we used to start our timer which means our timer is going to reset, the down bit is going to de-energize, so the condition that initialized our alarm is now not going to exist. And as long as our level is below 20%, the alarm will hold itself in. Once it gets up to 20%, this alarm is going to go away. And what do we want to do with that alarm? Well, remember, the low, low alarm is going to prevent nasty water from going out of our discharge valve. So what we want to do is use this alarm bit, this B300, to inhibit our discharge valve from energizing. So let's go back into our controls rung, and we come down here to rung 4, and this is where drain mode allows our valve to actuate. So we're going to put one more condition in here, and that condition is B300. So now we're saying as long as we are in drain mode, which means B306 is de-energized, and as long as our low, low alarm is also de-energized, go ahead and open the valve. But if we happen to get stuck in drain mode somehow, then our tank level goes below 15%, we're going to get a low, low alarm, which is not going to shut off until our tank is above 20%, which means our discharge valve will not energize open. Therefore, nobody's going to get sediment in their drinking water, and nobody's going to call us and yell at us the next day. That's a good thing. So we have this alarm bit, but we also perhaps want a notification bit. We want a separate bit that will notify the operator that there's a problem, but we don't want him to have to wait until the tank level gets up to 20% in order to silence that notification. If we use the alarm bit and we tie that to a horn or to a buzzer or to a flashing light, when the operator happens to be standing there and this problem occurs, he can't reset the alarm because this alarm is going to reset automatically based on the tank level. Well, if it takes 5, 10, or 15 minutes for that tank level to go from 15 back up to 20%, that means the operator has to stand in a control room with a horn blaring in his ear and a light flashing in his eyes for 15 minutes. 
That, obviously, isn't a great practice. So why don't we go ahead and add another rung right below our low low alarm and this one's going to energize a low low notification bit so we're going to go ahead and use another B301 we're gonna call it low low notification and this one is going to work very similarly to our alarm bit so we're going to go ahead and copy the logic straight from rung 1 to rung 2 and let's just change it up 1 we know we're going to trigger based on the same delay timer so our alarm and our notification are going to initialize at the same time the notification bit will be its own hold in so that's going to be B301 and this notification we do not want to reset based on tank level so we're going to go ahead and delete that condition from our notification and instead we want an operator to have to acknowledge this notification we want him to know that something went wrong now even though we're going to allow the discharge valve to open back up and we're going to allow the process to keep going once the tank gets back up to 20 percent and everything's normal again we don't want our notification to disappear because then when the operator comes to work he never knows anything happened so this notification is going to be disabled by an alarm reset button which might be a push button on a screen or it might actually be a physical button on the control panel and actually we don't want that to be an XIC we want that to be an XIO and how does this work this initializes with the low low level alarm delay timer being energized for five seconds it triggers our notification bit our notification bit holds itself in as long as the alarm reset button has not been pushed once that alarm reset button gets pushed one of two things happens if our tank level is still low then our notification bit is still going to stay active if our level has risen above 15 percent this down bit won't be energized so the hold in will keep the notification energized until the reset button is pushed. Now we still have one small problem with this, and that is that the main reason we want a notification bit is because we don't want the operator to have to stand there and listen to a horn for 15 or 20 minutes. So we need to trigger this notification one time and we don't want it to continue to trigger it over and over and over again every time this scans so to do that we're going to have to use a one shot and remember in a lot of programs for a lot of PLC's we can't just put a one shot here because the program doesn't like it when you try to branch around a one shot so we're going to have to put this one shot somewhere higher up in our program to make it do the same job so how we'll do that we're going to go back up to our rung zero we're going to put our timer within a branch and we're going to look for the down bit and now we're going to use that to energize a one shot rising and that's another control that if you don't remember how it works you definitely want to go back to programming fundamentals look the ONS, OSR, and OSF instructions up and get a refresher on how those work for now we're going to go ahead and assign a couple of bits to this so we're going to call one 
ll osr and that's our storage bit there's no reason for us to look at that anywhere else so we're going to clear out the symbol and the second one is going to be our output bit now we're going to use this output bit to trigger our notification instead of triggering it directly off of the timer like we are our alarm so I'm going to change this T42DN to our B307 so now let's look back through how this alarm is going to work one more time our tank level is going to fall below 15 percent it's going to stay there for five seconds or more at which time the timer 42 down bit is going to energize as soon as it does the first thing that's going to happen is it's going to energize this one shot rising bit for only one scan so on rung one since our T42 down bit is energized we're going to initialize our alarm and then on rung two since this OSR output bit was just energized for one scan which means one iteration all the way through the program until it comes back to here this is going to be energized and we're going to go ahead and trigger our notification bit now we already discussed how our alarm bit is going to work that hasn't changed but what has fundamentally changed is rung 2 our notification bit now let's say two minutes later our alarm bit once it gets up to 20 percent will reset itself and clear our notification bit however will stay energized until the operator pushes the reset button the difference is what if that tank level is 17 percent it hasn't reached 20 percent yet this alarm bit will not clear and cannot be cleared because we're resetting that when the level gets up to 20 percent this alarm bit is going to stay energized even if it takes 15 or 20 minutes for the tank to get up to this level our notification bit however is only going to energize one time instantaneously and that can be reset at any time and we can set up our high high level alarm exactly the same way we've got a rung below and we're going to go ahead and look to that timer to energize our high high level alarm so that's the T43 down bit that's going to energize an alarm bit we're going to give that B308 and call that high high level alarm we need a hold in for that alarm so that it stays energized once it gets triggered so we're going to branch around our trigger which in this case is the T43 down bit we're going to use the actual alarm bit B308 as a hold in on itself and how are we going to reset that high high level we're going to use a greater than condition on N70 which is our tank level and we're going to look for that to be greater than 75 percent so we're going to energize our high high alarm at 85 percent and once we get a high level alarm we are not going to let up we're not going to relax that high high level alarm until our tank level is at least lower than 75 percent so this hold in will keep this level alarm energized until our tank level falls below 75 percent which will de-energize our high high level alarm and I think that's all the programming we need on the alarm now let's go ahead and set up a notification bit for this high high level alarm so we're going to go ahead and put in a new rung and I think we're going to do this one the same way we did the last time we want to branch around our timer 
and we're going to use another one shot rising bit based on T43 DN being energized. So let's give ourselves one more one shot rising. That's going to be a high high OSR storage bit. We're just going to call that SB like we did last time. And one more bit is going to be our high high OSR output bit. And we're going to use that output bit, which is only energized for one scan each time T43 down becomes true. That's B3010, and that's going to be our trigger for notification. So we're going to use an XIC address to B3010. That is going to energize our high high level notification. We are going to need a hold in. So we're going to branch around our trigger. We're going to use the notification bit B3011 as its own hold in. And we're going to de energize our notification by means of our alarm reset. And that alarm reset was B302. And the one last thing we want to do is we want to incorporate our high, high level alarm into our logic. So what do we not want to happen if we have a high, high level alarm? Well, we don't want our fill pump to be energized. So we're going to take B308 back into our controls ladder, and we're going to use the absence of that alarm as a condition for the pump to be energized. So now, on rung three of our controls, if B306 is energized, that means it's set to a value of one, that means we're in fill mode, we will energize our pump as long as we do not have a high, high level alarm. And I'm going to go ahead and give that a symbol just in case we decide to look at it anywhere else. And now we have our alarm conditions interrupting process to protect our tank, to protect our pump, to protect our people from getting sediment in their water. We also have our notification bits which can be tied within other parts of the program if we decide to add something like an alarm horn or a flashing light that can be triggered by the presence of one or either of these notification bits. And we can also look at these on an HMI or if we have a host control system we can reference these notification bits over the network to know that something has gone wrong with our tank level. So when we talk about a dual bit alarm system, this is what we're talking about. We have an alarm bit and we have a notification bit and those two are controlled independently of one another. That is the best practice to use when programming alarms and notifications. Depending on what HMI you're using, a lot of people will use the HMI to handle a lot of the functionality of notifications and alarms. However, since the HMI functionality is by no means universal, it's usually better to put all of that functionality into your PLC program. That way you know where it's handled, you know it's being handled in real time, and you can program the controls manually on the HMI. Especially, that's important if the HMI goes down, if somebody changes the HMI, so on and so forth. It's not the best practice in the long run to have much of your system's functionality in the HMI. That's one more component on which your system is dependent to run correctly. So not to get off on too much of a tangent, but when possible, keep all of the functionality of your alarms and notifications inside of your PLC program. Now that we've programmed alarms into our level control program, Let's also go back to our heater program 
and put some alarms into that. Now here we had PID control, everything was analog. We are looking at a temperature coming in to input 30. We were scaling that to a range of 32 degrees to 212 degrees. We had some conditional logic here to keep our temperature reading within that range just in case we had an under or over signal. We were using a PID control to manage the output of 40, which is our temp controller, and we were using that to maintain an established set point of 72 degrees. So how do we add alarms and notifications into this? Well, since we're using a heater to heat, that tells us we have two possibilities for uh, alarms, and that would be our standard low, low, and high, high. And we'll go ahead and say, we're not real worried about a low, low alarm because there's not really much you can do within this program to protect ourselves. In our tank, we had a low, low, and a high, high because we were protecting against sediment in the water and against an overfilled tank. In this case, we can protect ourselves against a heater blowing up, but we really can't protect ourselves on anything if we get too cold. So this is one of those cases where we can program a low, low alarm, but does it really make any sense to do so? And the answer is probably not. And for the extent and purpose of this program, we're just going to go ahead and say that it doesn't. So let's go ahead and create a high, high alarm. We're going to go ahead and give ourselves three rungs to, to work with. And the first one we look at, we're going to be looking at N70 in this program also, coincidentally. That's going to be our temperature between 32 and 212. So we'll start by giving ourselves a couple of extra rungs to work with. And of course, we're going to be using a comparator greater than because we're comparing our temperature, which is N7 colon 0, with a high, high level. And since our set point is 72 degrees, let's go ahead and say our high, high set point will be 90 degrees. So that is going to cause an alarm condition we are going to use a timer again to initialize that alarm. So we'll take T40 and call that a high, high temp alarm delay. We'll have a one second base and we'll go ahead and make this a 10 second timer. And since we already know we're going to want a separate notification and we'll want to trigger that with another one shot rising, Let's go ahead and put our branch in, drop down our one shot rising, and we'll call that high high OSR storage bit. And for our next one, we'll have a high high OSR output bit. And the condition that's going to energize that one shot will be the down bit for our timer t4 colon 0 slash dn and now I'm going to go ahead and set up our alarm bit and our notification bit on the same rung using a branch so let's go ahead and use an xic to look for our t4 colon 0 down again And we're going to use another XIC to look for our one-shot rising storage bit, which if you remember from programming fundamentals will only be energized for one scan. And that's at B301. And each one of those rungs is going to energize a bit. The first one's going to be our high, high temp alarm. And our second branch is going to energize our notification. So that'll be high, high temp notification. And 
Each one of those is going to need a hold in, so let's go ahead and bring down a couple more branches. You see these branches can actually get pretty complex when you let them. Now we know each one of our alarm and notification bit will be its own hold in, so let's put this evaluating B302 and our notification B303. And now we're going to need a way to de-energize these bits from the hold in. Now our level alarms, low, low, and high, high, we programmed those so the tank level could automatically reset the alarm, but the operator had to engage the system in order to disable the notification. That's because a high or low water level really isn't that dangerous in that type of application. But now we're dealing with a heater. And what we don't want is a heater that's running amok and he overheating things. We don't want to burn up a heater. We certainly don't want to cause anything to explode. We don't want to kill anybody. We don't want to run up a high electric bill. So this alarm, we are not going to allow to reset itself. Instead, we're going to use an XIO and we're going to look at an alarm reset to allow that temperature alarm to go away. So we'll give that an address, call it an alarm reset. So now that hold in will sustain the high temp alarm until someone presses the alarm reset button. And for our notification, we'll go ahead and use two conditions. Obviously, the alarm reset is good enough to make the notification go away. But let's also give a second option for an alarm silence. And actually both of these should be XIOs because we want to keep the hold in circuit if those two buttons are not pressed. But when they are pressed we want to interrupt that. So we're going to right click on the control and click change instruction type. And we're going to make both of those XIOs. So now we have some good logic here. Let's walk through it. What's going to happen is if our temperature is above 90 degrees and we sustain that for 10 seconds, we're going to energize our T40 down bit, which is going to trigger our B301 one shot rising output bit for exactly one scan. The T40 down bit will energize our high, high temp alarm, which will sustain itself until the alarm reset button is pushed. And of course, since we're triggering with the timer directly, if the condition remains, we can hit reset all we want, but that alarm is going to keep coming back. And naturally, we don't want an alarm to go away while the condition still exists. The notification, on the other hand, is a different story. We're triggering that off of a one-shot risers output bit, which means it's only going to be triggered for one scan and then rely solely upon its hold-in branch in order to stay energized. And it will hold itself in until either the alarm reset or the alarm silence button is pressed. And this one-shot riser bit will not trigger again until this condition goes away and then comes back. So let's go ahead and run a verification. No errors, that means our code is good. And we have walked through two different instances of how to set up our alarms, notifications. We've looked at a few different ways to lay the code out a few different ways to manage both our alarms and our notifications. And we've got to, got to, got to make all the reasonable considerations before we start programming to write sensible logic that's going to handle the alarms correctly, that's going to prioritize safety, and that's going to take into account the operator using the system. 
We don't want the operator to be in the dark about events when things go out of control, when things fail, nor do we want to shut systems down needlessly, nor do we want to compromise anybody's safety. So these are some of the best practices out there for controlling alarms. Use them, love them, live by them, and everybody that deals with you and with the system you programmed will be very happy with your work. All right, so we're back and we're looking at our level control program again. And now we're going to have a brief discussion on set points. Set points are a tool we use to allow the operator to set limits and parameters within the system that affect the logic and can configure a little bit more how the system actually works. And the idea of this fits in nicely with our discussion on alarms, which is why I'm bringing it up here. So let's look back into our alarms ladder in our level control program. And you notice we set a low, low level of 15%. And that sounded like a good idea at the time, but there may come a day when that operator says, you know, I'd really rather have a low, low level of 5% or 25%. And at this point, that's going to require a call back to the programmer, a trip back out to the site, rewrite the program, test the program again, load the program, run the program with the operator, make sure that it's working the way that the operator likes before you go back to your home office. And that in most cases is not only undesirable but completely unnecessary. Let's say that this project has an HMI which means we're going to be connecting a screen up to the PLC that the operator can use to interface with the program. Well we have all these perfectly good integers and floats in our data files here's a good place we can use them. So let's start by looking with this low low level and maybe instead of 15 we write an integer location of N71 and we call that low low level set point from HMI. So now what happens is when the operator goes to the HMI he has a display that we've of course programmed and given him that allows him to see what the low low level is set at and then change it in the program. So we can give him that same control for the low low, for the low, for the high, for the high high. We can even give him that level of control for the preset on our delay timer. So let's say we wanted to add another rung of code up here. We're going to use a move command and we're going to move an integer of We'll call this generic time delay and assume that he's going to use the same delay time for all of his timers. And we're going to move that to T4 colon 2 slash PRE for preset. So now on every scan we'll be looking to see what the HMI has set in 72 equal to and we'll be moving that value to the preset. Now obviously for that set point we have to use an integer. Some set points can use floats and that's just fine for decimal points when we need a more precise figure. But for a timer, this timer can't handle a preset of 0.2 seconds. We really need an integer going into there so we might as well just give an integer whole number of seconds on the HMI. If we wanted to control that down to the millisecond, we can. We just need to change the time base of our timer from seconds to milliseconds, and we still need to use an integer for the set point. Now, since we have a low, low, and a high, high, we also have T43, we can go ahead 
and set those both on rung 0. So let's go ahead and throw a branch onto this rung, wrap it around our move command, and then add another move on that separate branch. We're going to move the same N7 2, but this time we're going to move it to T4-3's preset. So now on this one rung, we're moving our set point of a generic time delay setting, and we're going to store that into the preset of T4-2 and T4-3. And we can go through this program, and even for things like our I.O., we have an input minimum and an input maximum for the signal coming in. We also have an output minimum and an output maximum for the signal going out. Guess what? All four of those can be replaced with set points, and those can be operator configurable as well. Considerations, once again, plays a big part in these programs. There are some things you want to be within the operator's control to set. There are other things that should never be settable by the operator. And it really is a matter of discretion at the development phase of a program what things the operator will be controlling and not. What type of technical personnel does your customer have? Do they have a handyman who's going to be checking on your system twice a week in his overalls? Or do they have trained programmers and process engineers working on site every single day? Those things will determine what type of controls we put on a screen, what type of things we allow to be settable from an HMI, and what type of access we give them to the logic, to the controls, to the configurations within the program. While we want our systems to be flexible and useful to our customers, we don't want them to be able to hurt themselves. So sometimes when you're programming, you have to take the appropriate considerations and in many times save the user from himself. There's a lot of programming that you can use to safeguard a user against bad set points, but a determined incompetent operator will find a way to blow himself up if you make it possible. He will find a way. That being said, keep set points in mind. If you put in an appropriate amount of configurability using set points, you'll have a happy operator who doesn't have to call you every time he wants to change his program. Hey folks, that's a wrap on Section 8 of PLC Programming from Scratch. By now, you should have a very good understanding of what an alarm is, of what a notification is, of what the difference is between the two. An alarm is caused by an errant condition in a system. It's when something is out of control. It's when something's broken. It's when something is not working right. An alarm is typically used to limit or lock out some part of a program or some device from operating. A notification is used to tell an operator that something has happened that he should be aware of or that might need his attention to resolve. These two, while often initiated in tandem, should be controlled differently in most cases. Alarm resets and alarm silences often go hand in hand in not only keeping the system operating correctly, keeping the operator safe, but also keeping the operator from getting annoyed. Safety is always the first condition when programming alarms, but aside from that, the programmer also needs to pay a lot of attention to how the system works, how useful the system's going to be, and Remember, there's going to be an operator possibly standing by this system 24 hours a day. It shouldn't be annoying to him. He doesn't want important messages, important notifications to be getting lost because of an overabundance of notifications and him being told of everything every time a valve opens and every time a tank fills. 
Keep set points in mind whenever you're programming a system. What things should be settable to the operator? The more customization that can go into a system, generally the happier the operator is going to be and the more flexible it'll be in case they need to replace a sensor with a different range from the one that was initially shipped with the system or something like that. But you don't want the operator to be able to hurt himself putting in bad set points or accidentally forgetting to type a zero or typing too many zeros. Some of the logic we created got a little tricky. I understand that and it's perfectly reasonable to go back through one or two of those lessons over, pick through that logic and make absolutely sure it all makes sense. See if you can find a better way to do it. Chances are you'll probably see that that is a very good practice for controlling alarms and notifications. Understand the logic, have that in your back pocket, but please, in the future, when you're writing your programs, don't forget to take the appropriate considerations. That's always the difference between a poor programmer and an experienced, competent programmer that people love. I'll see you in the next section.